Hi, this is Dr. Barbara Howard. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And I'm here remotely to talk to you about common behavior problems in young children, an important part of the care of children. I wish I could be there in person, but I am recording this talk for you uh, as an alternative. So the problems of behavior in young children um, are all related to the natural movement from a child being completely dependent on their parents to being progressively more independent with age and how the child and the parent negotiate this make a difference in what kinds of behavior issues come up and also how to solve them. So young children have a variety of basic needs. The first one is the need for state regulation. That's regulation of both being awake and asleep and of being aroused or calm. Subsequently, they develop the need for mastering things and the need is always there for a positive emotional tone in the relationship to have the best outcome. They also have a need for learning and getting help with regulating their negative affect and arousal, and they need to learn pro-social behavior and empathy. Now, a lot of these things are actually naturally part um, of child development, but how, they, how smoothly they progress um, do depend on the environment and what the, the caregivers do. So let's start with the need for state regulation, which begins as soon as a baby is born, actually. What helps regulate state is routines for eating and sleeping at regular times and consistent responsiveness to the baby's cues by the caregivers. The combination of routines and consistent responsiveness stabilize the child's mood and reduce their resistance to doing the things that are needed for them, whether they're pleasant or not for the child. It's also important to avoid overstimulation. Excessive noise or uh, a not enough sleep time provides the child th with the conditions where they are, tend to be uh, overly aroused or erratic. This is especially important for temperamentally irregular children by temperament or unadaptable children. And some children are especially vulnerable due to biological factors such as central nervous system damage from uh, birth, birth trauma or lead poisoning or prenatal substance exposure. It's also less likely that state regulation is being managed well if the baby is living in, baby or older child is living in social chaos. And that can happen regardless of socioeconomic class um, because sometimes the whole family is overextended in what they're trying to do. So let's talk about some of the progression in uh, state regulation and uh, starting with sleep. So one of the first sleep problems occurs after about four months uh, from term gestational age. Now with sleep, everything is related to gestational age um, because that's all uh, determines the development of the brain and premature babies will meet these same problems when they um, are at the adjusted age, which would be full term. So for four months post gestational age, about half of babies can go eight hours without a feeding. Um, and this occurs by about 1.3 months of age. And 95% don't need a 2 a.m. feeding by the time they're about four months of age. But if that's not your experience with babies, there are things that can get in the way of developing this ability to sleep for a longer stretch. One is that children actually learn to expect food and, and act like they're hungry. And this is especially true if parents have trouble separating. And as soon as the baby stirs, they go in instead of waiting for the baby to self-console. So some of the management for trained night feeders after these ages is to make sure that they get a feeding um, at a, after uh, in, in late in the evening. Sometimes parents think, well, I'll put the baby to bed at 7 a.m. and they'll sleep until 7 p.m. and they'll sleep until 7 a.m. But that's actually an excessive amount of time to expect them to not be feeding um, at this age. Therefore, making sure that the parent understands that there should be a feeding perhaps around uh, nine or 10 o'clock at night would be appropriate. And then you can actually help the child lengthen 
um, the, the interval between the feedings that they expect by lengthening during the day, making them wait just a little bit longer each time before they're fed. Then you can wean the nighttime feeding. If they're breastfeeding, they can wean it by about one minute per night. Or if they're bottle feeding, you can start weaning it by about one ounce per night. Now, along with all of these strategies, it's important to watch out for sleep associations. So the baby needs to be placed in bed at least a little bit awake. Um, I know uh, that my babies, when they were breastfed, if there was a temptation to then put them in bed asleep because they seemed so peaceful, but actually they're not learning an important skill, which is how to uh, console themselves and resettle if they're always placed in bed uh, asleep. This is not true for every child. Um, some babies don't have any trouble with that, being put in bed asleep and they stay asleep. But for many, they need to be placed in bed at least a little bit awake so they learn how to put themselves back to sleep. And then when they wake up in the night, um, having the parent look at their watch and wait at least one minute before going to get, to the, get the child so the child has a chance to uh, self-console. Now, I mentioned sleep associations, and those are a problem in many kinds of uh, uh, sleep behavior problems. So sleep associations mean that the circumstances of falling asleep needs to be replicated in order for the child to feel a sense of safety for falling asleep. And this is really true for all of us, even as adults. Most commonly, the sleep association that's the problem is that they're in body contact with the parent and possibly also sucking on something. So a good way to make sure that sleep associations don't cause sleep problems is for the parent to place the child in bed awake, starting by two months of age, so they can learn how to settle themselves down. This also needs to be done both at nighttime and nap time. Um, and if a babysitter or someone else is taking care of the child during the day, um, both situations need to include being in, put in the in the crib um, uh, slightly awake. Now, if this is working okay, don't forget the basic principle of child development and behavior is if it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. But if there is a sleep problem, always look for sleep associations as something that needs to be taken care of. The next sleep problem that tends to come up is at four to eight months post-term gestational age. So about over 80% of ch children wake up in the night, but we don't hear about sleep problems in 80% of babies. Why is that? Well, most of them can settle themselves back down without requiring intervention from the parent, but some don't resettle. And how does this happen? Well, four to eight months is a really interesting period. If there's, uh, it may start when the family is sort of stressed, the child is aware of the stress or there's been a change, someone is visiting, the child is sleeping in a different room. Um, and then what happens is the child wakes up at night and the parents provide secondary gain, meaning they give some kind of reward. Now, simply their attention and being picked up is enough of a reward. But of course, if they're also fed, then you have the problem that we just talked about. Um, this kind of night waking is especially increased in children who are temperamentally so-called difficult, but also in parents who are depressed. Now, why would that be the case? Well, I think depressed parents often find that uh, attending to their baby in the night is actually something, one of the few things they enjoy in the day and the night if they're depressed overall, but also they may not be t paying adequate attention to the baby during the day and they either feel guilty or the baby feels more deprived from this and is more demanding at night. So what can you do about children who persistently have trained night waking? Well, first of all, manage whatever the precipitants are. Obviously, if the mother's depressed, you wanna help take care of that. But if there's been a change in routine, um, try to settle those things down. Establish routines and make sure that the family is limiting naps, family and babysitters are limiting naps to two hours and the child is being put in bed awake because of those sleep associations I talked about. And then whoever's taking care of the child at night should wait for about five minutes into any spell of crying and try to go in when the, there is a lull in the crying and then stretch this out to uh, 10 minutes or more. So gradually increase the amount of time they wait before going to attend to a child who's waking up in the night and the child will learn to stretch out their sleep period. 
The next kind of night sleeping problem is what is called developmental night waking. And it's called developmental um, and occurs after about eight months post-term age because that's the time when babies develop what's called object permanence. And that means when something is out of sight, it's not out of mind anymore. They actually remember and ask for the parent's attention in that way. And this happens plenty of times during the day. If the parent goes out of the room, the child starts to cry. That's the same kind of phenomenon. So knowing that this is going to happen, when the parent's coming in for their six-month checkup, I always want to talk to them to avoid developmental night waking. So if the, if the child wakes up in the night after this age, um, if the parent uh, doesn't reinforce them, doesn't uh, lift them up, doesn't feed them, doesn't even pat them, um, they can go and check on them, but not anything else. It will disappear in between one and four weeks of age. Now, sometimes this happens because there's a kindly babysitter. The parents have carefully not had any babysitters up until this age, and then they finally decide they can go out uh, on a date or go away from the baby on a, on a trip, and the child wakes up to a stranger. Now, the other developmental process at this age is stranger wariness. So the child expects to see the parent because they have object permanence. They see a stranger and they're frightened. And then they're terrified. And every night after that, they wake up screaming. So the best way to avoid this is to talk about it through anticipatory guidance and explain um, the reasons that I just explained. Make sure there's a bedtime ritual, maybe including some kind of uh, a, a a soft toy, if that's what's being used as a transitional object to help the child have something that reminds them of the parent. Um, maybe put a light on, a, a dim light in the, in the bedroom. And then when the child wakes up in the night, the parent should only go in when the baby's been crying at least two minutes. Reassure them briefly, and then the parent can actually sleep in the same room with the child, but without talking or picking them up. Now the child is no longer frightened because the parent's right there and they can see them, but they uh, sometimes become angry, but they eventually will go to sleep. Typically, this only takes about four nights until they don't wake up anymore. I always tell parents a week, just to give yourself a little bit of, of uh, slush room there. Um, now, if this is happening at bedtime, not in the middle of the night, the parent can put the child in bed with their regular routine um, and then sit in the chair near the bed, but not talking, maybe even reading a newspaper in front of their face so the baby can't see their face. And then every night move one foot closer to the door until they're out of the room at night. This will typically take care of those bedtime problems with young babies. Now, remember that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends sleeping, having the baby sleep in the parent's room um, for the whole first year of life and also have a pacifier. Um, sleeping in the same room with the parent, as long as the parent doesn't uh, respond to the baby, works okay. The pacifier can be a problem um, because when it falls out, the baby may wake back up. So uh, you can take that advice with that grain of salt. Now, children in the second year of life uh, can start having nightmares, just as older children can too. Now, remember, nightmares are occurring in the last third of sleep when the child is arousing from uh, deep stages of sleep. So this is really common. 10 to 50% of three to six-year-olds have nightmares. And sometimes these are, as for older children, associated with stressors, things going on in the family. With older children, nightmares can come because they're um, coming off of some medication, like a medication for ADHD, for example. So what can you do about nightmares? Well, um, First of all, have a regular routine for putting the child to bed that's soothing, okay? It's not good to go to bed when you're upset about stuff in general at any age. And you can even have the parent prepare the child for good dreams by having them act, talk about what they would like to dream about tonight. If the child wakes up with a bad dream, the parent should attend to them and reassure them that the dreams are not real. Think about stresses that they can do, but keep the child in their own room. If a child has come out of their room, um, which is common in the United States, and walked into the parent's bedroom um, and then gets into the parent's bed, then you have an additional secondary gain. So it's better for the parent to actually intervene briefly in the child's room. Very severe nightmares, these are generally older children, 
um, that might come from things like um, sexual abuse or trauma of some kind. The, in those cases, medication like diphenhydramine or trazodone or ciproheptadine can help, but I never recommend this because they, they don't work even without the behavioral intervention, right? And behavioral intervention will work and doesn't have all those side effects. So only consider medications for sleep in very severe situations like PTSD. What about the child who takes more than 30 minutes to fall asleep? Well, uh, sometimes that's the best part of the day for the parent and the child. And if they want to have a longer routine than 30 minutes, well, that's up to them. Okay. But children will take as much as they can get, as you well know. Therefore, setting a limit on the length of the ritual may be helpful for the parent and the children can learn um, that all they're going to get is 10 or 15 minutes at bedtime. Um, and then the parent has to go out of the room. So that's actually a, a limit setting issue for the parent. But it's also appropriate to make sure that the child is having enough attention from the parent during the day. Uh, I often recommend special time when this is happening, special time, not at bedtime, special time before that, so that the parent has got, given the child individual one-on-one -on -one attention and the child doesn't feel deprived and the parent isn't feeling as guilty and therefore will be able to set the limit on bedtime routines. What about children who have a trouble falling asleep? Well, typically this is a what's called a phase shift problem. So children have an expected amount of sleep requirements, which I'll show you on the next slide. But let's say we've got two to four year olds. Well, they need 11 and a half to 13 hours of sleep when you count the nap. Now, usually there's only one nap in the afternoon after age one, but if the child is in daycare, the daycare provider may be very happy to have the child sleep two or three hours, in which case they've used up that nighttime sleep period that, that would otherwise be uh, cause them to feel tired at nighttime. So the first thing you can do is have the parents keep a sleep chart of all the sleep, daytime and nighttime, daytime naps and nighttime sleep. Getting enough exercise during the day is uh, important for sleep. This is uh, generally not a problem with young children because they run around all the time, but it may be important for older children. Trying not to have that exercise close to bedtime, however. Establish a bedtime routine and then start the bedtime at the time when the child is naturally appearing to be tired, limiting the naps, keeping meals and sleep the same all week, but wake them up at the expected time for the length of sleep that they should be getting, then work your way back from that. Because what this does by starting at the natural time that they're tired might be 11 o'clock in the, in the evening, because that's when they're sleepy, you will reduce the resistance to uh, going to bed and, and being able to fall asleep. So these are the average sleep ages required. And as you can see, I was talking about two to three year olds, and this is night and daytime sleep. Um, by four, there's generally no afternoon nap, but these are good uh, rules of thumb for sleep at all ages, uh, which in the United States, at least, it's rarely accomplished for the older children. And that's a huge problem in our culture that hopefully you can avoid. Now, what about children once put asleep? Uh, come back out. We call it curtain calls. The parents have finally settled down, maybe watch a little TV or talk to each other. And ta-da, there's the child coming out into the room. Well, they may not be tired. They may have a phase shift going on, or they may just like the secondary gain of getting attention from the parent. Remember, even negative attention is better than no attention from a child's point of view. So even if the parent yells at them, that's still attention. These children may not be kids who adhere to limits in general. And I'm gonna talk about that in a separate session um, on discipline, but managing limits in general is uh, important for kids who are doing a lot of curtain calls. But also tell the child the plan. Here's the plan. Uh, the parents also have to be prepared for any excuses the child might have. So they might get one more request. So I sometimes do this with what's called a bedtime ticket, where the child goes to bed with a little piece of paper. And if they have one more request, they can come out and cash in their piece of paper. And most, um, and then after that, if they were to come out, the parent would put them back to bed without talking or close the door to their room. Now, 
if they stay in their bed, uh, they get two stories the next night before they go to bed. Otherwise, they only get one. Now, of course, every child should get at least one story read to them before they go to bed. But this reward is especially effective because they're being told, oh, you get two stories tonight because you stayed in bed all night yourself last night. <clears throat> now, with younger children, you may have to put a screen door up or put a gate to their room so that their room becomes their crib. And if necessary, hold the doorknob. Now, I don't recommend locking children in their room because it's scary for the child <clears throat> and it gives the wrong message to the parent that they are free to ignore their child's pleas, right? But they could sit and or stand and hold the doorknob if necessary. Uh, the child can tell that the parent is there. The parent should not be talking to the child. Now, what about the child who comes out of their room in the middle of the, middle of the night, climbs into the parent's bed, and in the morning, there they are? Well, if the parents don't want this to be done, then they could put some kind of noise maker like bells on the door uh, to the parent's bedroom so that if the child comes in, they will parent will be able to return the child to their bed but again, without any secondary gain, no scolding, no talking at all, return them to their bed. Night terrors are a different story. Night terrors are a physiological problem that occur in one to 3% of children, um, even up to age 15, um, mostly for children under age six. And what happens is the child wakes up screaming, pale, their heart is pounding, they're sweating, their pupils are dilated. Um, they're breathing fast, thrashing, incoherent, inconsolable, and in the morning, they don't remember a thing. Now, this is a matter of uh, arousal from different stages of sleep. And so it occurs mainly during the first sleep transition uh, out of deep sleep at 15 to 90 minutes into sleep. So that's one way you can tell it's not a nightmare, it's a night terror. It may be brought on by loud noises that wake the child while they're in that transition stage, or if they're overly tired, or if they have a full bladder and didn't pee before they went to bed, or if there's a lot of stress going on. And once a night terror occurs, they may occur multiple times per night for several days. This is more common in boys, in people with a family history of night terrors, in kids with immature central nervous system, 50% end by age eight years. Oh, great. Um, but 36% continue into adolescence. Well, what can you do about these night terrors? Well, first of all, I'll explain, this is not an emotional illness. It's a physiological difference. Help not provide secondary gain, um, decrease stresses, and actually an afternoon nap will actually decrease uh, these because it decreases the stage three, four transition. So instead, have the parents wake the child up one hour into sleep, for about a week. And what happens is that this changes the sleep cycles to break the cycle of sleep terrors. Of course, you wanna protect the child because thrashing around, they can actually get hurt. Um, having someone sleep in the child's room actually also helps. They're less likely to wake up. Do we know why? Not exactly, because they're just aware in some way of the parent's presence. Medications, again, not generally recommended, not really needed. But if you need to use a sleep medicine, diazepam or amipramine or amitriptyline, amitriptyline are ones that work, but I am not recommending medications for sleep. What about children who are frightened at bedtime? Well, there's a typical time for this. And the time is usually during preschool when children are learning how to handle their sexual and aggressive uh, feelings. That's when they have temper tantrums. That's when they have hitting and biting is, is toddlers and preschoolers, but they can also uh, be exposed to things in the media that are frightening to them. Also, if bedtime fears suddenly happen, consider whether the child has been traumatized by something um, and being sure to provide special time to the child during the day and set limits on their aggressive behavior, but not spanking. So avoid physical punishment. Um, because that makes the child generally afraid and less trusting of their parents. Avoiding caffeine's good. It's in things you might not expect. Acknowledge that the child is frightened, but the fears are not real. And teach them coping skills and relaxation skills, especially teaching them how to um, do mindfulness or relaxation and deep breathing at bedtime. Um, I often recommend that the child have their own flashlight by the bed so they can check and see that those things that they're thinking about are not real. And believe it or not, 
going in and pretending to exorcise the monsters uh, in a dramatic way with monster spray or swinging a broom around the room can reassure some children and they actually find it, uh, they find it funny. Keep in mind that not getting enough sleep destabilizes the frontal lobe and worsens all mood disorders at all ages. And of course, a parent with sleep debt is also more irritable. So having people keep a sleep diary and always consider obstructive sleep apnea if there is um, snoring um, or uh, gargling in the sleep, in, in, during sleep, those are things that might be an indicator of obstructive sleep apnea, which is also more common if there's any kind of uh, oral facial malformations um, or in the case of uh, obesity. So it's important to, with any behavior problem to work on sleep at least first or even simultaneously uh, because sleep will stabilize many other kinds of behavior problems and even help with attention deficit disorder symptoms. Okay, well, that's what I'm gonna talk about for state regulation. Now let's talk about uh, the ins and outs of young child behavior problems. So let's talk about the ins. So for the ins, I'm gonna talk about eating problems. So remember that I said that dependency and independence is the dilemma going on. And the dependency of infants can actually be overwhelming, especially to first time parents who didn't know it was gonna be so hard. Doctors often say in the new, when babies are born to breastfeed every hour and a half as needed, but, they, but we may forget to tell mothers to stretch out feedings to allow for nighttime sleep. So if feeding is a complaint, also consider maternal depression, as I mentioned before, because depression can interfere with establishment of a good feeding routine. I mentioned that feeding helps regulate state. Um, children cry when they're hungry and sleep when they're full, but you should always, especially in the first two months of life, consider first inadequate feeding if you've got an excessively crying child. There is a phenomenon known as colic, which is not related to feeding, um, but uh, inadequate feeding as a reason for crying is important to recognize because they need to feed more. Uh, and looking at the weight gain will help you understand if that might be the case. So of course, breast is best, both for mothers and for babies. There's some things you might not know about breastfeeding, which is that it introduces a variety of tastes to the child and reduces feeding problems. I'm gonna talk about in a minute reduces them later in terms of picky eating because they've had in utero exposure. But by about seven months of age, breast milk alone may be not enough for growth. Um, also, children need to learn to tolerate the discomfort of figuring out what to do with solid food in their mouth. Um, and I'll say some more about that in a minute, but they certainly spit it out in the beginning. They have to learn how to put up with that. But it's very important actually essential to introduce solids at least by 10 months of age, or there can be long lasting problems with accepting solid foods. So if a progressively more solid food is not introduced in this window of time between six and 10 months, um, major eating problems can occur. So children learn uh, to eat, uh, but every child uh, has a preference for the sweet taste. Even when they're in utero, they've done studies of fetuses and fetuses swallow more when glucose is injected into the uterus, believe it or not. So um, children like sweet food and will take it in preference. Well, why is it that children like sweet food? Well, we think it tastes good, right? But there's another reason that children like sweet food and fats and carbs. And that is because they satisfied your hunger fast, like in minutes compared to things like protein and roughage, which take longer to uh, satisfy, although they're more fulfilling. Actually, it's part of learning how to reduce your caloric intake. But for children, um, they need to learn to expect food at certain times and caloric amounts during infancy. So intrinsically, babies will stop when they're full. <clears throat> Extrinsically, toddlers will eat what you give them, which means you can actually make them fat, especially if you're giving them sweets or fats. As in preschool, <clears throat> children take more of their cues about how much to eat by watching their peers. Remember, commercial baby foods are an invention. There's nothing magic about the amount, 
texture or components of, of manufactured baby foods. There's no magic to feeding vegetables before fruits when you're introducing new foods, but there is magic to increasing the texture by adding lumpiness. Um, sometimes you can do this if you're feeding food that you're making yourself for the baby by grinding up or, or uh, putting things in the blender uh, for fruit or even adding cracker crumbs. But that increased lumpiness, as I just mentioned, needs to be started before 10 months of age to avoid problems. Um, it's important to feed solids when children are uh, first in a meal before the liquids, because if you let them drink first, they'll be full. So the struggle of managing solids is worth it if the baby is still hungry. Aim for both use of a cup and table food by about 12 months of age. And definitely avoid giving bottles whenever the child wants one because children will take all of their calories in the form of bottles and then give a, a fit about eating meals if that's not managed properly. <clears throat> Keep in mind that toddlers slow their growth by about 12 months of age. If you look at the growth chart, they grow faster before 12 months of age than they do after 12 months of age. So they actually require fewer calories after 12 months than before that. It's also normal for children to take in their calories over 48 hours and to go on food jags. One day they'll eat two bananas or three bananas and a hard boiled egg. And then the next day they may eat almost nothing. That's okay. Uh, some days eating nothing, if they're acting healthy, is perfectly okay. So why do parents get upset about this? Well, they worry, right? And they may actually miss the dependence their baby has on them because remember, they're be learning to accept the baby's independence also. But the biggest issue in toddler eating is related to autonomy because autonomy and independence is the name of the game for toddlerhood. Children and toddlers want to do things on their own. And it starts maybe earlier than you might think. But this the behavior of wanting to be more independent has meaning for the child because they want to be more independent, but also for the family who may be sad that the child is growing up and growing away from them and doesn't need them or may feel rejected if the parent's been working during the day and they come home and the baby doesn't want them in the way that they used to. So behavior problems uh, in toddlers around eating can be either initiated or maintained by that meaning. And that's not just for eating behaviors, it's for all kinds of behavior problems. The other thing is that universally food is love. If you go and meet a new person or visit their house, you will invariably be offered something to eat or drink because it's a sign of uh, bonding uh, between people at all ages. But learning to, being allowed to learn mastery in eating is really important. Experience of mastery need to respect the need for autonomy, but also must avoid overwhelm, uh, overwhelming the child or neglecting the child. So at around eight months, uh, post-gestational, post-full-term gestational age, there's a phenomenon called hatching, which can result in the battle of the spoon. Hatching means the baby wants to do it themselves. Now, I remember my daughter didn't even want me to dress her at eight months of age because she wanted to do it herself. Now, of course, she couldn't do it herself, um, but uh, so that that is a normal uh, developmental phenomenon. So this is a time when the battle of the spoon can emerge. And this is more likely if the parents are overprotective and pushing the spoon at the baby, or if they're overly strict and they're restricting the baby from participating in the feeding or even restricting them from getting enough to eat, especially if they're inconsistent or if the parent is setting inadequate limits or routines in general. So what are the things that will help with a healthy uh, feeding development of a healthy feeding relationship. First of all, routines. Uh, you've heard me say it before, eating at about the same time every day, offering finger foods early, and when the child can, bring them up to the table because they want to participate. They socially want to participate, even if they can't talk about it. Being in a high chair separated from the family rather than participating in family meals may cause the child to protest. Watch out for parents who avoid, who give complicated foods or gourmet foods. For one thing, if the child then dumps it on the floor, which they're likely to do, the parent may get upset. 
but also children uh, may have trouble accepting all the different flavors of complicated mixed together foods. If there's a struggle over eating, I recommend that the child be naked and uh, fed over a big piece of plastic so that dropping things on the floor or smearing it on the tray or getting it all over their face doesn't cause the parent, sometimes a very particular parent, uh, to interrupt the feeding or try to take it over. Uh, afterwards, you can then stick them in the bathtub. So the kid's naked, of course, not the parent. Now, um, feeding problems. What about the toddler who is either refusing or begging for food all the time? Now, it's interesting because the management of this is the same, whether it's a refusal problem or a begging problem, because autonomy in toddlers is more important than hunger. They may refuse food or they may beg and gorge food. So, of course, the person who's complicit in this is the parent. So the parent may have issues with uh, being concerned about the child's uh, uh, development. They may feel pushed away by a child who wants to do things on their own, as I mentioned before. But it's important that they not try to chase the child around in order to get them to eat. Or some people play this airplane game. There's even a spoon that looks like an airplane trying to distract the child and stick the food into the child's mouth when the child is not expecting it or wanting it. They want to do it themselves. So if you see any one of these um, situations, um, the parent may in fact need to be referred to for behavioral counseling to deal with the psychodynamics, but there is something that can interrupt this cycle pretty easily. Instead of trying to feed the child, have finger foods on a low table where the child can get food and drink, acceptable food and drink, not sweets, right? But the parent should not comment. Now, the parents can silently watch and keep a record of what the child eats if they're really neurotic about it. They should still invite the child to the table at meals, but let them down from the table if they don't want to eat because they've had enough. Typically in only a week, four, even as early as four days, the child will prefer to sit at the table to eat than to be relegated to getting the food for themselves from that low table. And watch out that the dog or the cat doesn't go and eat that food for the child instead. So this is a way of taking the power game out of toddler eating. What about picky eaters? Well, picky eating is actually uh, very common. Um, it's related to a variety of things. Temperament, some people are temperamentally more selective, the desire for autonomy that I mentioned, and it tends to develop at the time, at about 21 months or older, when children are aware of the differences in different kinds of food. So children before 21 months will basically eat anything, which is actually a problem because sometimes they get poisoned, right? Um, but it presents as, uh, refusing or demanding certain textures, certain preparation. They want the sandwich cut on an angle. They only want to use a certain spoon and rituals. So what are some of the things that affect these preferences? Well, there are cultural traditions and family tastes. <clears throat> People in Vietnam, probably those children probably accept different foods than Americans do, maybe to your advantage, actually. There are some universally non-preferred types of food, such as spinach, and pears. Spinach, because it has oxalic acid in it. And did you know this, that when babies are fetuses, they have taste buds throughout their oral pharynx and down their throat. Now these regress and the taste buds are left only on the tongue, but children are more sensitive to tastes than adults. That's why old people like to put a hot sauce on everything. Um, so there are certain non-preferred types of food because they actually taste stronger to the baby. And of course, they're not required as part of the diet. So just give those up for a while. Now, modeling makes a difference, especially heroes and watching peers eat the food that might otherwise be undesired by a picky eater. Uh, we've got Popeye who ate his spinach, but having a peer come over who will eat that food can be very helpful. Watch out for food contingencies. If the child is promised um, a, a cookie, when they eat their uh, vegetables, um, that makes them think that the vegetables are actually probably not very good. Keep in mind also that children may have picky eating because mealtime interactions are 
obnoxious to them, that there's uh, there's hostility or fighting going on at the table, um, or they may act like they're picky in order to get uh, social attention at the table. But one of the things we know makes the biggest difference in reducing pickiness is repeated tasting. Tasting is needed. Repeated tastes increase the variety eaten. And I mentioned that even the tastes in utero make a difference. Looks are not enough, but there are some methods that have improved the range of foods, uh, improved the range of undesired foods that children will eat. Um, and those are modeling, as I mentioned before, having other people without mentioning it, just eat the food. It's good to not mention it. Don't put it in the kid's face. Um, praise and sticker rewards. And when a reward is given for eating a little bit of a vegetable, the same previously undesirable vegetable, a little bit of it every day with a sticker reward afterwards and praise for eating it, doing this every day for at least 14 days in a row, increases in, in studies have increased the, um, the range of foods eaten and the range of foods that the child actually liked. So that is a method to improve eating. So some other things that will improve eating is scheduling three meals. Typically a child needs three meals and three snacks, but always served at the table. Don't have them running around the house with the snacks because they uh, will get in the habit of finding that they prefer that kind of independent play and they can actually overeat uh, if, if it's done that way or eat their meals while running and then refuse to eat when they're at the table. Put the food on the child's plate that includes something that's acceptable to them. Now, how do you introduce new foods? Well, something similar to ones they've already eaten or a combination with something they already like, like some chocolate on a piece of fruit uh, will increase the likelihood. Even a microscopic amount, the size of a grain of rice um, of an undesired food, if ingested regularly and repeatedly for about 14 times, will actually increase acceptance. Sometimes a new brand, a new way of preparing a food that they currently eat, or sometimes uh, sprinkling a new food on, currently, on food that is currently acceptable. Again, modeling by peers is also very useful. So 18% of young children are picky eaters and 7% of older children, even adolescents are still picky eaters. So who are these kids with food selectivity? They may omit entire food groups like no vegetables, no meat or protein. And the, the lack of this variety can limit their growth and their nutrition. Some that are particularly a problem are iron, vitamin A and vitamin C. And when they grow older, it may limit them socially because people think they're weird because they don't eat normal stuff. Now, this selectivity can be expressed with crying, tantrums, gagging, even vomiting at the sight of the food. Obviously, that's also obnoxious for a child who's gagging and vomiting when they see the food that other people uh, actually want to eat and they have that kind of reaction. Of course, we need to think about medical problems when you hear about this. Some of the things that we know result in eating and feeding problems include um, having an episode of food poisoning. If you've gotten sick by eating this food even once, you don't even wanna eat it later. It's a very strong conditioner, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because as animals, as we were developing evolutionarily, if you would get sick after eating something, you and everybody around you, all those other animals, should learn that that's dangerous and you shouldn't eat it. So generally speaking, a food that has had that kind of reaction can just be avoided even perhaps throughout your life. An allergic reaction can certainly do that. It's very scary to have an allergic reaction to a food. Gastroesophageal reflux actually also produces um, sensitivity to eating and may cause food ref refusal. Oral motor incoordination problems that result in trouble chewing or swallowing without choking um, are conditioned responses that are scary. Aspiration, including from, for example, a TE fistula. Um, and to some extent, lactose intolerance can also cause an aversion to foods that give that reaction. Remember that constipation also causes cramping, 
um, and a lack of appetite. So severe constipation is something you ought to think about when a child is uh, seeming to refuse food um, and ask about those bowel issues. Some children have anxiety uh, and the anxiety is manifest in lots of different ways, but including an anxiety about uh, trying new things. And that's trying new things that are not food, not just trying new things that are food. Sensory integration disorders are a real phenomenon. Um, and when you combine things like anxiety, constipation, and sensory integration disorders, think that the, think about the possibility that the child has autism. We're gonna be talking about autism a lot uh, during this visit to Vietnam, um, but autism has both anxiety and sensory problems and food uh, ingestion problems uh, all related. So um, we know that if you don't address eating issues early, they tend to persist. So the fruit variety of things eaten is actually higher at 27 months than it is at 60 months if you don't do anything about it, right? The fruit variety eaten at two actually predicts to what they will eat when they're six to eight years old. 40% of irregular eaters at age five are still irregular eaters at age 14. Um, and 28% of two, two to four-year-olds, they have food fads, but 16% of seven to nine-year-olds are such are still such affected. So these are things that can be a lasting lifelong problem um, and can be in some cases a nutritional threat. So it's a good thing to take care of. Severe food selectivity um, has been addressed at some, in some important studies, which is similar to the um, method I talked about before. And that in this case though, there's a whole program at Penn State where the child is given a pea-sized amount of a new food and a bite-sized uh, amount of an accepted food. The child is required to eat the A, the pea-sized, in order to get the B plus a small drink. And this is done for about 10 minutes. If they don't eat anything, they are don't get anything more to eat until the next meal. So an alternative to this is one bite per meal or one bite per day. And uh, you can fade in increasing amounts of uh, liquids that are otherwise undesired. So that method will also uh, decrease food selectivity. Watch out for supplementation. Uh, yeah, supplementation is nutritionally sound and supports growth, but it tends to be calorically right, dense. It tends to be calorically dense um, and removes the drive to eat. So high fi fat and low fiber um, foods result in constipation. Um, and that often is what is in supplementation. Um, also, uh, supplementation is not introducing the variety of tastes and textures. Milk actually has similar problems and excess milk can actually cause anemia, milk bottle caries, and even bronchitis. So those are serious problems uh, from excessive milk, particularly having a bottle all the time. So what uh, is in our differential diagnosis of mealtime issues? Well, you wanna ask them, how is mealtime? Uh, if they're refusing textures, very picky or choking, think about regulatory sensory integration, medical or selectivity issues. If the parent is insisting that child have excellent manners, that's probably an over-controlling parent that's causing the problem. If the child won't come to the table or won't sit or throws food or hits the siblings at the table, that's probably attention getting, or it may be a child with attention deficit disorder. So all of these things can be combined also in mealtime problems. Um, in order to deal with behavior problems, parents need to set limits, set a rule before the meal, and dismiss the child from the table if they break the rule, take their chair and their plate away. And don't let them have anything except that same plate of food an hour later. This is a way to let them know this is not acceptable behavior. Okay, let's talk about the ouch. That is elimination problems in young children. Remember again, that behavior has meaning for the child and the family and can be initiated or maintained by that meaning. And you'll see that in a minute. And in the case of toileting, Everybody knows their kid has got to be using the toilet if they're going to go to Harvard or even go to school. So toileting is a sign uh, of requiring social uh, success. So how do we get around to teaching about toilet training? 
Well, first of all, uh, this starts from a very early age. So what could I mean by that, that children are learning from birth? Well, parents talk to them about their body parts, talk about being wet or dry or, or poop or pee. By changing diapers frequently, they teach the child to expect to feel comfortable. By the way, if they don't change the diapers frequently, children often become oblivious and toilet train later. We're modeling all the time. In fact, you can't keep a toddler out of the bathroom when you're a parent um, very easily. So at least in the United States, the way we toilet train is, to, what way we recommend as pediatricians toilet training is to wait for the child to be ready to do this in an autonomous way. And that includes when they signal before going. Now the signal might just be pointing to their diaper or wiggling their bottom. When they are staying dry for several hours in a row, so you'll have a better shot at it then, when they can walk, climb, follow commands, and like to imitate, and most importantly, when they want to please, because this is kind of a nuisance for a child to interrupt what they're doing and go and use the toilet. They should be accustomed to the pot gradually, um, keeping it nearby and having them sit regularly on the pot after meals when the gastrocolic reflex increases the chance that they'll actually produce something and of course, praising success and avoiding shaming them about anything related to their toileting. A lot of children are actually so-called trained uh, before 16 to 18 months of age. And if they are so-called trained, they often relapse, um, which is actually uh, common because the fun of it, was, they've, they've mastered the fun of it and now they don't care about it anymore and they're too busy, they wanna do something else. Keep in mind that children who uh, have well-established uh, toilet training and then they start uh, soiling themselves either by pee or poop, uh, that they may have a urinary tract infection or they may have a diarrhea syndrome. Those are important things to keep in mind. But most of all, um, a child who has a relapse, it's best to just relax and wait and be matter of fact about cleaning them up and not punitive. Um, sometimes bribery works, uh, giving them a prize for uh, using the potty. Um, but if it's a control issue, that's something that should be managed uh, through the management of discipline that we'll talk about another time. Something that works with children, uh, even children with intellectual disability, is a process of overlearning. So breaking the process of going to the potty, uh, pulling down your pants, sitting on the potty, wiping, uh, getting up, pulling up your pants and washing your hands, practicing it 10 to 20 times after each accident and praising success uh, is something that will work uh, for children of any age. But of course it can also become a power struggle. So that's why I mentioned control issues first. So what do we do about control issues in toileting problems? <clears throat> the management is actually of under controlling parents and over controlling parents, it's basically the same. And that is be reasonable, establish reasonable limits, um, including in, throughout the day, not just about toileting. These are children who are out of control in general, um, limiting aggression, limiting intrusiveness. Sometimes you'll see this four-year-old coming in uh, to your office and they're under the mother's skirt and they're grabbing her face while she talks and they're the parent is obviously not managing the child's intrusiveness. Dealing with sibling issues may be very relevant uh, because the child may be taking it out on siblings and then feeling guilty about that. Um, increasing modesty is a, probably a good idea if the child is having trouble with toileting also. I mean, not co-bathing, not bathing with an opposite sex sibling, not sleeping with an opposite sex sibling or even with the parents. Um, and avoiding the people looking, be, being nude around the house. Um, those are things that sometimes happen. I'm not saying that those are bad things, by the way. It's only if the child is also having trouble with toileting that you would think that maybe we need to increase modesty to make the child feel less concerned about their body. Because after all, the little uh, girls look around and see that boys have uh, fancy genitals, and they say, what happened to mine? They don't say that, but they wonder about that. 
Similarly, little boys, and more often little boys, look at little girls and say, oh my gosh, what happened to hers? Um, and so that that kind of comparison, they're not talking about it, but it makes them nervous um, about going to the potty, especially for poops, because gosh, it looks like that thing, that poop that goes down the toilet looks an awful lot like a body part. So maybe I can lose my body part. And this is something that is cognitively um, in the realm of possibility at that age. They don't understand about things that can be changed and things that can't be changed about their bodies. So having individual special time with the parent every day uh, can be very valuable if there's a control issue in general with the child. Letting the child finger paint with pudding, probably chocolate, right? To let them kind of relax about the messiness of pooping. Establishing a stool pattern using roughage or even a medicine such as Miralax is very important because children who have irregular stool because they're refusing to go to the toilet can become very constipated. And of course, having more common, more commonly occurring poops makes it easier to train as, as well. Like two poops a day makes it possible to have two opportunities to learn every day. So then rewarding the child just for sitting on the toilet maybe even sitting in their clothes to start with, uh, and then gradually sitting without their clothes, and then finally success. So they can get rewarded for each of those steps um, as they're progressively becoming more accommodated to it. Um, I talk to parents who are having this problem, uh, give them the penis talk, which I'll give you in just a moment, and also uh, will teach you about the room restriction method. So Room restriction basically tells the child, um, unless you use the potty, you're not going to get to do other things that are fun. Now, this won't work if you don't establish appropriate limits first and establish a stool pattern, as I mentioned, even with laxatives is necessary. Then tell the child the plan. This is the parent tells the child and have them either in some easy to pull down pants or actually naked in some place in the house uh, that's uh, relatively soil soil proof like a linoleum floor or something for refusal to pee uh push liquids and then take the child to the potty every hour and a half um for rewarding any um any times that they actually do pee um and not commenting on children who are have do not pee and have already wet themselves but for stool problems for refusing the potty, a room restriction method can work. So put the potty chair in that room. They can play. Um, I would recommend no TV or electronics in there. Make it boring, but not a prison. Um, and then if they use the pot, then they are free to go for the rest of the day. Any accidents can be cleaned up matter-of-factly. Typically, after you establish all those things at the beginning of this slide, it takes only about two days before the child will then use the pot. Now, a child who suddenly uh, has a fear of the toilet, um, think about whether an injury has occurred or if there's been some sexual misuse, um, but children who are just generally afraid of toilets can be desensitized by looking at a lot of toilets, doing a lot of flushing of toilets without being expected to perform by going on the toilet. A scrapbook, um, and combining relaxation rewards and steps to the toilet. Keep in mind that some toilets flush automatically in public places. I recommend that the parent bring along um, a, a little package of sticky, sticky uh, poster things to put over that electronic eye so that the toilet doesn't automatically flush while the child's in the stall there. That's very scary for children to have that happen. Now, how about children where you have their, you have no idea why they're afraid of the toilet? Again, watch out for children who may have been sexually misused, but this can be related to their body image, their cognitive understanding about whether the penis can disappear or not, and Oedipal issues of sexuality and aggression that I've mentioned as reasons for controlling nudity and co-bathing and so forth is to take that uh, reduce the stress of those issues that the uh, children in this age group of two to four-year-olds are worried about. So what can you do? Well, establish limits, um, talk, handle sexuality in a matter-of-fact way, um, and talk about the poop party under the house. Now, 
is there a poop party under the house? Well, actually, the poop does go under the house through the plumbing. Um, but making it like the child's poop is missing out. So your poop doesn't get to go to the poop party? Oh, too bad. And then ask the other people in the room, does your poop go to the poop party? Oh, yes, yes. How about yours? Do you? Oh, yes, yes. But Joey, no, his poop doesn't get to go to the poop party. Matter of fact, handling of toileting, don't make it a pleasurable experience. Like don't have it be a sensual thing when they clean up messes. Um, and then try the room restriction method. Now, what is this penis talk I'm talking about? Remember I said the children aged two to three worry about their penis falling off or having fallen off. So my little spiel to them is that boys are made with penises and girls are made with vaginas. When you get to be big like daddy, your penis will be big too. You get to keep your penis forever. You say that to boys, nothing can take it away. And to girls, you never had a penis. You will have a vagina forever. So giving it words and a promise of permanence is something that you may not have thought would be helpful, but actually kids often are quite relieved. And of course they tell this story to everybody they meet in the grocery store. Well, there's selected references at the end of this talk in your handouts. I hope that uh, these things are helpful to you. Some of them may not be culturally relevant to you or be showing up as a problem, but if they do, you can try some of the things I discussed. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.